Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Title is Lightweight Materials, Improving Safety, Efficiency, and Sustainability. I'm Jim Olson with the National Tile Contractors Association, and I want to welcome you and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend today's webinar sponsored by Ladycrete International. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind you that during the webinar, you'll be muted. Please use the questions area on your computer to type in your questions, and we'll answer those questions at the end of this presentation. If the audio on your computer is poor, either turn up your volume or call the number on the invite to this webinar and listen on your phone. All NTCA webinars are available to watch at any time on the NTCA YouTube channel shortly after the webinars are presented, giving you easy access to watch and or share all current and past programs at your convenience. All right, here we go. Today's speaker, Marcel Shane, Lady Creek Technical Services Manager, Special Projects, has been a professional in the commercial flooring and tile industry for over 20 years as an owner, project manager, estimator, sales rep, technical service rep, and installer. His in-the-field experience combined with his industry certifications have made Marcel a resource to the industry on virtually every aspect of the commercial flooring and tile market. Welcome, Marcel. Looking forward to a great program. Thank you, Jim. An honor. All right. So I am going to get started. Um, let me just do a couple things. I'm going to shut my camera off. I tend to lean when I read. So thank you again for everyone for joining. Um, it truly is an honor to uh, be able to do this opportunity. All right, so let's get right into it. Uh, lightweight materials, improving safety, efficiency, and sustainability. As Jim mentioned, um, I have been in the commercial flooring industry for quite some time now. Um, honored to be with Latacrete, a truly uh, you know, perfect situation for, for my work-life balance. Um, and then, you know, to be with a respected company in the industry is just an honor to be a part of. So let's get right into it. And I apologize. I've All right, there we go. We're moving. All right. So as always, you know, this is protected by uh, copyright laws. So reproduction, distribution, display, and use of this without my permission is prohibited. So don't do it. All right, so lightweight materials, improving safety, efficiency, and sustainability, uh, learning objectives. All right, we're gonna go over you know, lightweight materials, whether they're substrates, setting materials, some of the benefits of those lightweight materials, the safety and efficiency benefits that they provide, uh, some of the freight and shipping challenges that we face now as an industry, and how these help with that. Uh, also touch on raw material shortages, that's uh, no secret for sure. And then sustainability, which is you know a big concern for the industry as a whole. Let's just get right into the products first. We'll not gloss over that. We'll get right into it, okay? Um, so uncoupling mats. This is nothing new. Um, these have been around for a while now. I just want to point out some of the benefits. Uh, there may be some aha things in here that you didn't realize. Again, always working on safety, efficiency, and sustainability, right? So these are going to replace, you know, traditional underlayments, plywood, cement boards, stuff like that. Some of the obvious benefits are going to be no bulky boards, which scratching walls, cabinetry, you name it. There's nothing worse than going in to do a floor. You nick the paint and now you're on the hook for that. Um, easier to install, less dust and debris. Most of these are going to be able to be cut right on the project site. Um, so, you know, something as simple as a pocket knife is going to be able to do that versus having to have a cut room or go outside. So you have less waste, less dust, easier to clean up. But the obvious advantages are, you know, going to be the safety um, for the workers and obviously, you know, using heavy equipment and stuff like that adds to that as well. Um, so, for example, one roll of this certain type of uncoupling is going to get you 323 square feet, all right, and weighs 41 pounds. Compare that to quarter inch backer board to get that same amount of space. You're going to be looking at over 21 sheets, all right, weighing 480 pounds plus the 1100 screws that you're going to have to install. So you can imagine being able to put the one roll of 300 plus square feet on your shoulder and get into a job is a lot easier, a lot safer for your workers than the backer board. Taking into consideration plywood, which is you know obviously a common substrate on projects as well, you're looking at 1,280 pounds to get that same area. So it's pretty easy to see the safety benefits there and the efficiency. The same could be said for preformed shower systems as well, right? Um, these are certainly much lightweight, uh, much more lightweight than the traditional mortar bed, which you used to use and still do to pitch the drains. But now you're able to, again, get these spaces installed quicker, easier, lighter, more efficiently, 
They're waterproof most of the time on the face. So you're getting the whole surface area of the board waterproof where you only have to worry about treating the seams and screw holes versus traditionally where you'd have to let some mortarboard set, let it dry, then put the material over it. So it's pretty easy to see the benefits of those as well. Mortar beds, okay? These have even gone lightweight, right? So the setting materials themselves are going lightweight. Mortar beds are still very common, very popular. Um, you think large gang showers, uh, you name it, where you have to pitch the drains, roof decks and stuff like that. So they've, gone, they've been able to be developed now to be half the weight and get the same coverage, all right? Which is a huge benefit, all right? So versus a conventional thick bed, you're gonna get the same performance, half the weight. And the way that these materials are created, manufactured, due to the raw materials, a lot of them actually contain no respiral silica. So the safety there alone is huge, which we'll go over a little, little bit farther in the presentation. And then consider the benefits of the lightweight when you get into, you know, since COVID, um, outdoor living space has, you know, been a boom. Everyone's looking to, whether it's restaurant owners, homeowners, plaza index of apartment buildings, you name it. They're looking to utilize all that space, get outside as you know, as more uh, more than ever before. So you can imagine what that lightweight material is gonna do for places like this, that building load, all right? When you consider, if you see this little detail off to the right, you're adding almost two inches or more sometimes to get that proper pitch to the drains on these roofs. So you could easily see the benefit of these materials. Self-leveling elements. That was always lightweight just by nature compared to say a traditional mortar bed, right? When these came on the scene, they were easier to place, lighter weight. You didn't have to do as much buildup on those things like you would a traditional mud bed. <clears throat> Even these are going lightweight now, all right? So again, half the weight, same coverage, all right? And now you're getting compress compressive strengths. Not bad mouthing gypsum, but you know that the issues that come with that, right? Um, so SLUs, you're getting as high as 4,000 PSI from these lightweight SLUs. Again, half the weight, same coverage. And some of the other obvious benefits are gonna be that you can go from as low as a uh, eighth of an inch all the way up to four inches thick in a single lift, which is a huge benefit, all right? Especially when you consider the weight is 70 pounds per cubic foot for a lot of these versus concrete where you're looking at 145 pounds, uh, traditional self-leveler 125 pounds, gypsum. A lot of people think, well, what do we need a lightweight self-leveler for gypsum's lightweight? Well, you can see here, it's actually a lot heavier than these. And then lightweight concrete even, these are lighter than that. So efficiency, safety, you could imagine loading the building, uh, staging this stuff is a lot easier. And I wouldn't be doing uh, these products justice if I don't get into the ease and the safety that actual the, you know, the equipment to put to place these materials provides, all right? So a lot of times these are gonna be barrel mixed, um, but there's technology and machinery out there now that you can actually pump this material, all right? So there's actual on-site pumps. You can stage these outside of the building. You can go up you know, 20 stories plus sometimes with boosters. Um, so small to medium pumps, you're looking at 200 plus bags an hour, all right? Large pumps, mobile blending units, uh, which are becoming popular, especially like inner cities. You're looking at 600 bags an hour. So imagine the safety for the labor crew alone, not to mention less dust in the building. And the big thing is faster return to service, right? That's gonna be a common theme. And now it's no secret that tiles are getting bigger, right? Uh, back in the day, eight by eights were actually considered a larger tile. Those are almost, I don't wanna say obsolete, depending on the style, but you know, quarry tile, stuff like that, is about the only time you're gonna see tile that size, unless it's something highly decorative, all right? So the tiles are larger than ever. GPTP, for example, you know, they're creating new standards. These things are ginormous, all right? So you're looking at ANSI 108.19, 0 0.20, and then, you know, 137.3. The reason these are able to be installed um, and, and get bigger is, you know, advances in the technology of the actual adhesives themselves. So we're looking at the ANSI A118.15 mortars. With that tenacious bond they provide, putting tiles this size up are no problem anymore, right? And as we know, a lot of these larger tiles require special tools, whether it's glass tools, trowels, uh, leveling systems, uh, suction cups to move them around, which we'll get into in a little bit. And the size of them requiring them to be back buttered. So it's advantageous to actually have lighter weight adhesives to install these, right? And I just wanna point out one of the big things that's helped our industry with these larger tiles is the IBC 2021, right? This came out and now allows larger module size tile porcelain veneers to be installed exterior, larger than ever before. So this is a great advancement for the industry, right? It should definitely increase tile consumption. We don't need to get code variances when specifying these. 
opens the door to all these larger format tiles. All right, again, usually you're gonna wanna use those 118.15 adhesives, which have become lighter weight, okay? So again, that same adage, right? Half the weight of the traditional, same coverage. So this makes these, you could see these GPTP uh, tiles being installed. This is a training that we did, all right? You could see how large these are. Multiple guys, special tools to move them around. You're actually putting the material, the adhesive on the back of the tile and the floor as well. So half the weight is a huge advantage to these, right? So you're promoting easier and safer installation. And also because of the way that these are manufactured, you know, the less silica or no silica in some cases, they're easier to use, right? They're more creamy, easier to install, which helps promote proper coverage, which is crucial for these tiles, reduces voids, um, and basically overall increases successful installations, which is all we want in this industry. It doesn't stop there, all right? Grout innovations have made this stuff lighter weight. Now you might be saying, well, what's the matter if the grout is lighter weight? Technically it's not. Innovations in the pigment and the way those are mixed into the, in the grout is uh, actually helped a lot in the industry. Okay, so now you're able to take pigment packs, put it in the water, right? Mix that in and then take a grout base and put that into the pigment mix. And then you're getting the full range of colors with just having to use the, the, uh, the grout base, right? So you can imagine the shipping costs alone. If you're getting, again, more material, more coverage out of less material, that's huge for the, you know, the, the shortcomings that we have in the freight industry now. And then also consider how this helps distribution. All right, you can see here to the left, typically say a company had 40 or so colors, you had to stock all those colors and hopefully you sold them all before they ran out of their shelf life, right? Now you're able to actually just stock that grout base, keep the color packs. So inventory space is a lot more advantageous, much more beneficial for these distributors, which everyone is seeming are trying to downsize nowadays, right? So these innovations, these lightweight innovations are coming full steam, right? We're responding to the needs in the industry. And this is where we're at. So long story short, you know, I'm not gonna beat the dead horse here. You're gonna be getting the same coverage with half the weight. They're easy to transport and stage, right? Um, even consider, you know, loading buildings now, you can't just, you know, flood the building with your material. So the more you could get in while still getting the same coverage is advantageous. Uh, you have no, no material touches the ground rules in some states. So this is gonna help with that. And like I mentioned, they're easier to work with due to the no silica, creamier, smoother, and then obviously the, the health benefits of the no silica as well, which we'll get into. So working safer, all right? We can't just wrap it up and say, that's it, they're safer. Um, there is some responsibility, some education that is involved, not only on the materials that you use, how to use them, and some industry standards, which we'll basically go over. It wouldn't be an NTCA presentation if we didn't give you the educational side of things, right? So let's learn how we can work safer. You know construction industry health and safety is a huge challenge, right? In 2019, it was estimated that over 80,000 lost time incidents occurred. That's daunting when you think about it, right? We don't want workers' comp claims. We don't want these jobs shutting down, okay? So like I mentioned, the no silica is gonna you know, reduce respiratory illness. Eye injuries are a big part of it. Again, it takes more of the education and PPE. So anything we could do to make safer projects is gonna be advantageous. So like I mentioned, this takes knowledge and education, right? It's up to us. We can't just say, oh, I'm using a lightweight, that's it, I don't have to worry about it. We need to run companies, be manufacturers that take this accountability and support this safety initiative, right? We need to take ownership and then execute upon that. So protection, process, product, right? It all kind of goes hand in hand. Back injuries at work, right? The causes, lifting heavy objects is obvious bending and how we do that when we carry them, incorrect posture, long hours, repetitive tasks, right? Construction's hard, um, especially when you consider tile insulation, flooring insulation, you're up and down on your knees, lifting stuff. It's very, very taxing on the body. So the more we could do that, the more we could do to make that easier on our employees, the better. Some of the facts, over a million back injuries are sustained in the workplace annually, right? Construction is, Definitely the bane of that, you know, one of the highest incident rates. Basically 25% of construction related injuries are back injuries. So only the common cold is gonna account for more lost days of work than back injuries. All right, back injuries at work. So prevention, material handling, like we just talked about, lightweight products is certainly gonna help, right? 
again, I go back to say like that uncoupling that. Imagine just bringing one roll of 323 feet versus board after board after board, okay? So proper lifting techniques, all right? I'm not gonna tell you how to do this stuff. Hopefully we're all doing it right, right? But we're gonna bend at the knees, not at the back. Ask for help if it's on over 50 pounds, right? And a big one is use equipment, all right? There's no benefit of showing off and showing how much you can use. Use a fork truck, use a power truck, uh, use cranes to get it in the building, you name it, all right? Stage elevated, again, like I said, a lot of that is that no, nothing hits the ground, that's a big part of it. They don't want people bending over repeatedly picking stuff up. It's gonna be higher for you, so again, it's always easier. And obviously lightweight products are gonna certainly contribute to that. Prevention, right? Laborers in this industry, our body is our money maker, right? So we have to stretch, we have to strengthen, we have to be conscious of that. We can't abuse our bodies, all right? Again, it's almost comical how construction has become, I'm not trying to badmouth it, but speed is over safety almost and quality a lot of times, right? It's getting to the point where it's, you know, something that we have to step up and take care of ourselves, right? So do the proper things that we need to do to prevent these injuries. Knee injuries at work, okay, same thing. Make sure you're using the proper PPE. Keep that contact stress down, all right? We don't want to increase that. We wanna minimize that. So knee pads, kneeling mats, how we handle those materials. Again, lightweight products are gonna be a huge help. Proper bending techniques, all the stuff we just talked about. Prevention again, you know, use the proper shoes, equipment. You know, use a back harness or something like that to help you with posture if you need to, okay? Keep that environment dry and clean. All right, keep obstacles out of the way. Back end knee, you know, a clean job site is the safest job site. So make sure we do our due, dil due diligence on the front end so we're not hurt on the back end, all right? And again, take care of yourself. Very, very important. Now, respiral silica, okay? This OSHA has brought a lot of attention this recently, okay? What is it? It's a mineral found in sand, stone, concrete, traditional mortars, all right? It's created when processing stone, rock, concrete, brick, block, mortar. Also in the cutting process, right? If you're doing a reno job or cutting into, you know, say a concrete slab, it's there as well, okay? Some of the health hazards, silicosis, lung cancer, COPD, kidney disease, and even autoimmune diseases, all right? All things we do not want. So it's gonna take our due diligence again using products that don't contain these materials. A lot of the lightweight materials, like I said, they don't, or they have uh, levels that are below the actionable uh, limit for OSHA, all right? So where do they come from? Quartz, ceramic, granite, sand, all these ones are probably obvious to you, right? Preventative measures, okay? Again, know your products. Look for ones that talk about not having the rest of the silica, okay? Do your due diligence, okay? Show that they have the testing and approve it. Isolate your workers from exposure. PPE is a very simple way to do that, right? Make sure you're wearing masks. A lot of guys say, oh, I can't work with a mask. It's too hot, I can't get used to it, I wear glasses. I used to work in wood flooring when I first started in the business. You get used to it, all right? Trust me, you'll notice the health benefits right away when you start wearing one as well, all right? Use ventilation systems, negative air, stuff like that to actually keep those spaces cleaner for you, all right? Be mindful, use wet cutting methods for sawing and drilling. All right, it may take a little more time, it may take a little more cleanup after the fact, you know, to get that area dry again, but do the due, due, due diligence. We have to start changing our approach in the industry to be safer, right? HEPA vacuums are huge. A lot of commercial jobs require them now. You can't set foot on a job without them, right? So just make sure that you have the equipment in place to keep your employees safe. Don't use compressed air for cleaning. Um, <laughs> I did a hospital project when I was still on the commercial, you know, project management side of things and walked into a building one day and the super was going crazy. The guy was cleaning off the floor with a leaf blower, all right? So think about what he's doing there. He's actually blowing all that dust back up into the air, into the HVAC system in a hospital. So imagine ORs, a cancer ward, something like that, things we cannot do, right? So make sure we use the correct, the correct dust collection tools and measures to prevent problems from the rest of the silica. And again, the products themselves. There's a lot of them out there now, these lightweight ones, are perfect for that environment. It uh, goes without saying, sustainability is extremely important in the industry now, right? Specifying projects, this is almost, I wouldn't say number one concern, but it's right up there, right? Definitely 1A or 1B, okay? So make sure that you're using products from companies that have sustainable measures, right? Products that are UL Green Guard. They meet lead requirements, right? Companies that have HPDs, health product declarations, EPDs, 
safety data sheets. Make sure that they have this documentation and can prove and provide the people that are using these products or specifying them the knowledge that they need to have a safe environment, right? Companies that have ISO standards for their processes and manufacturing. That goes a long way, okay? Not only for the employees that work at the company, but for the end user as well, all right? Made in America is a big one. Again, sustainability, renewability, that is a very, very big topic in the industry right now. And then a big push that we're seeing is recycled and renewable. How can we reuse this product, right? So you can imagine if we can reuse something, it's gonna be beneficial not only for future projects, cost, but sustainability. One of the big reasons and main concerns in the industry right now as a whole, if you don't know about it, Google it, it's a real thing, all right? There's a raw material shortage, all right? There's more than just sand, but sand is a big, big problem right now. The world is literally running out, okay? Sand is the world's most consumed raw material after water. It's used in construction, obviously, roadways, you name it, railways, but there's actual erosion on our shores, right? So sand is being used, obviously, to replenish those, all right? So it's a very, very, very hot commodity and one that is not replenishing itself fast enough, okay? It's one of the greatest sustainability challenges of the 21st century, according to climate environmentalists, right? And it's true, it's not a secret. All right, think about concrete, cement, all of these products. They traditionally use sand. These lightweight materials have actually been able to go away from that. So you're not just getting the benefit of it being lightweight, easier to get on the job, easier to transport, and all those things. You're actually saving the world, right? <laughs> you're saving one of our most valuable resources. So we need to start changing our perception as installers, as manufacturers, and realize that we got to change the way we consume this, okay? It may seem like a big ticket on the front end, but think about all the stuff in the back end, right? That could be said for the safety, you know, the, the mindfulness of being safe on the project as well. We need to start changing our approach. Not everything can be fast and cheap now. We have to start thinking about sustainability. So you may think you don't need to wear a mask because it's bothersome, but what's more hurtful to your projects or your family or you name it if you're not on the job, right? So we need to start changing our perception. These topics are ecosystems. We're talking about human life the life of our planet, right? And lightweight is a great way to start, right? We're just the tip of the iceberg. So the more we could do now in embracing these lightweight materials and better practices, the better we're gonna be off in the long run, right? So we need to start somewhere. And again, this is a great way to start. The time is now to make the connection. We need to take ownership. And again, just start setting new standards, okay? So working faster is another big concern in construction, obviously, always, right? That's speed. We always think about construction projects now, especially the big commercial stuff, they're always looking to get done faster. I was in the commercial flooring industry for years, about 15 years, and it was always speed, speed, speed. How fast can you be done? How fast can you be done? How fast? When are you gonna be done, right? <laughs> um, we can still do that and still be safe and be efficient and be sustainable, right? So, a lot of the reasons we can do this is a lot of these white, light, uh, lightweight materials are rapid now, right? We have rapid setting adhesives. We have rapid setting mortar beds, grouts, waterproofing, for example. These adhesives now, you can have time to grout after installation with adhesive as soon as two hours versus 24 or more typically. Mortar beds, you can walk on as soon as one hour in some cases, all right? Waterproofing is ready as little as 60 minutes sometimes, two hours versus 12, 24 or more when you can do a flood test, all right? Grouts, you can get those secure and be ready as soon as three hours. And then think about multifunctional products. That's a big trend in the industry. So it's not just lightweight, it's lightweight and what else can we do with these products, all right? There's products out there, for example, that you can do sound control, anti-fracture and be the adhesive all in one. So anything we could do to get onto that next phase of the job is advantageous. Again, without risking any safety, okay? You imagine hospitals, operating rooms, retail spaces, right? These are, every day they're not open, that's money. No one likes to think of a hospital as a money maker, but that's their number one concern, right? Every day that an operating room is shut down, that's a lot of dollars. In the construction industry, when you bid on these huge commercial contracts, there's actually retainage or damages for every day that they're not open, right? Um, so you figure, say, a retail location. They know that their projected LA location makes $15,000 a day. So they'll have it written into the contract, you know, for every day that we're not open past a certain date, that close date, that penalty is put back on the general contractor, all right? And we're in the finished trade, all right? We're with the paints and everything. We're pushed to the end anyway. 
So a lot of times if you work in this industry, it's gonna be like, hey, uh, we want you to start Friday, and by the way, we gotta be open by Monday. So the more we can be faster and safer, the better it is for our industry. So we're basically just innovating and evolving to the needs that we have, right? That's always what we should be doing, continuous improvement. So we're gonna work faster. One of the first examples I showed was shower systems, right? So now we have those shower pans. We can use rapid mortars. They're preformed, already waterproof. A lot of them have integrated drains. So think about that time that's saving. You're not pulling a whole mud bed, packing it down, waiting for it to dry, then waterproofing, then waiting for that to dry, and then setting the tile. You're able to get on this stuff a lot faster, flood test a lot faster. Shower walls, again, we have liquid applied products. You're looking at as little as two hours they're ready to go. Some even as quick as 30 minutes. Lightweight, waterproof, tile-ready boards, like we talked about. So again, that whole surface is waterproof. So think about the time you're saving. We're able to take projects that would take 72 hours or more, knock them down to 16 hours or less, depending, right? So faster, but also safer. We're not compromising here. But again, like I said, the education is a big part of it, right? We can't just assume that it's on the materials and that's it. We don't have to worry about anything. As people that work in this industry, we have to you know, build safety into our projects by knowledge, knowing the methods, knowing the standards and following them. They're there for a reason, right? They're gonna be tried and tested and established for the industry to again, ensure successful installations, not only for the owner and user, but also the installer, right? So we need to know about the, res the resources that we have, right? ANSI, for example, American National Standards Specifications, okay? Know these standards, know what they're for, whether it's a material standard, installation standard, know what we're getting into. Exterior is a huge bane in our industry, right? A lot of guys might you know, be a very good installer outside. They do bathrooms here and there. They get a project where now they're asked to install tile outside. They go and do it like they normally would, all right? But they don't realize that all installs aren't the same, right? There might be climatic conditions that are different or the material itself might, might not be able to handle that. So make sure that you're using material that could handle those environments, okay? Safety isn't just on the setting material. Make sure that you you know, are following, again, TCNA has environmental classifications. Like I said, not everything's the same. So know the exposure that your installation can handle, whether it's a material, the setting material, you name it. Submerge is not the same as dry, okay? A good example is natural stone. All right, you can see here, this is just warping of a natural stone, right? This is inherent. So you don't want a guy just saying, oh, that tile's, uh, you don't want a customer going to say, I don't know, you name it, floor and decor, picking out a tile they think is beautiful, right? And then they put that on the wall only to find out that it's gonna curl, crack, break, fall off, all right? So safety goes beyond the material. We'll get it a lot that you know your material failed. Um, it's cracking, it's falling off the wall. When in hand, it's just because they didn't know or follow the industry standards and best practices. Movement joints is a huge one, all right? Consider all the things that happen on a building. Buildings, bridges, all these massive structures are made to move, right? They have expansion gaps in them to move especially you think earthquake zones, they're made to move a lot more. They're gonna face thermal expansion, live and dead loads, shrinkage of the concrete, wind, seismic movement. All these things are inherent on a building project. So we have to account for them, we have to know about them, right? It's in, you know, tile and stone, they're rigid. They're not gonna flex and move, okay? The adhesive putting them up, although they could handle a lot more than they used to, they're not gonna prevent the building from moving, right? We'll get a lot of people say that, uh, well, I wanna use you know, um, crack isolation to prevent cracks. I'm like, well, that's only gonna do it to degree. It's not gonna hold the building together and stop it from moving, all right? So we have to know about these things and incorporate them. So you're basically talking about any change of plane or any change of material really, right? If you're butting up to a wall, a corner, you should account for that movement, all right? You need to put a flexible sealant in there. Again, you can imagine direct, direct sunlight and exterior install, for example, the thermal expansion and contraction that's gonna face. Freeze thaw, you go to Canada, you're gonna have summers where it does get up to 90, 100, and then winters where it gets below, you name it, right? So you have to account for this stuff. The last thing we want is again, stuff falling off the building and then blaming it on the adhesive or something like that. It's not the adhesive's fault, okay? So it's, it's up to us to be safe as well. We gotta institute these best practices into our installs. So you could see here, the top left in an example, a couple of things, right? This is obviously going up a wall, elevated. You're probably looking 30, 40 feet at least. They didn't do a few things. They didn't account for any movement at the windows. They didn't account for any movement here at a joint in between the floors, 
all right? And that started falling off. That's not the adhesive's fault, okay? The adhesive isn't gonna stop that from happening. So if they put a nice joint right through the middle, incorporated that into their design, they'd be fine. You could see in the top right, a short little detail here. It's something as simple usually as a backer rod and a flexible sealant, which now can basically match any grout or you know, packing material that you have. So you're not taken away from the design aesthetic, okay? The middle here is a pretty funny one. Um, same thing, they didn't account for any movement. They just slapped these up on a wall, looks beautiful, they walked away. Now they've actually designed the net <laughs> so the, the stones actually don't fall on the tables when people are eating, all right? This is not what the owner paid for, I can guarantee you that. And the bottom right is actually a column where you can't really tell in the picture probably, but that's wrapped in plastic. These stones are falling off, they wrap it in plastic, now they're up there beautiful, safety, all right? So again, just take a little time up front, do your due diligence to know the industry, the standards and why they're there, and we have to follow them. And I just wanna point out too, you know, the EJ171, these incorporation of these joints and stuff. I don't want, if there's any tile installers on here to be nervous and think that you have to become an engineer now, you don't, right? You need to know about these, you need to be looking for them or asking about them when you bid the projects or install them. But there's engineers, architects that should be doing this into their design. If they don't know about it, bring it up to them. Give them the TCNA handbook, provide them the EJ171, be a resource for them, right? But they should be the ones specifying this. They should know the movement of the building or have accounted for that when they build it. All right, you'd be shocked how many times they don't. And then they come on the back end pointing the finger at the installer, which then goes down the line to the adhesive manufacturer and you name it, all right? So these things again are in line to provide lasting insulations for the building life cycle. A big one on any installation, especially vertical ones too, not just the expansion, know the deflection, right? Did they account for the proper deflection that these require? Follow local building code, all right? The IBC, local building code, refer to that. Make sure that it's being followed before you install. One of the big things and challenges in this industry is that when you accept or install on a substrate, you basically accept the responsibility for it. It's very hard to recoup your money after the fact, okay? So point these things out before you install, right? You don't want to put it all up, have it start falling, and guess what? They're not going to repay you to do it, okay? They're either going to hold your payment. As you know, probably these commercial projects, you don't get paid half up front like a residential job. You actually pay, you bill as you go, right? AAA progress payments. So you can only bill for what you install, right? So if you did 10% of the building, you're only billing for that. And then there's retainage set in too. So they could keep 10%, hopefully a little less than that, at the end of the project, almost as an insurance policy. So if this starts happening before you're done, guess what? You're not gonna make a profit, all right? The last thing we want is to do stuff for free. And the other thing that we don't want is insurance claims, liability claims, and stuff like that. Again, safety, right? It's on us to know what we're doing before we get into it, and then uh, do everything we can on the back end or front end, actually, to prevent any losses. Also, link up and look for companies that do testing, right? It's very easy for a manufacturer to say, hey, we have this, we can do that, all right? Make them prove it. All right, for example, Miami-Dade, or Dodd, tomato, tomato, whoever you say it, right? That's a hurricane zone. So make sure that these companies have done testing with their products that can handle these types of environments, okay? It's very easy to say, yeah, we can hold that tile, but make them prove it. What have you done? You know, put the money where the mouth is. A good example is here in Chile on the right. The actual, it's probably got over 10 years ago now, 13 years ago maybe, but there was an earthquake there that was so large that the city of Santiago actually moved 11, 11 inches to the west and Concepcion moved 10 feet, okay? But you can see here, there's a direct adhered install that was barely affected by that. So again, just make sure you have products that have done their due diligence to know that they can handle these environments. Surface prep's a big one as well, all right? This is often ignored, um, especially a lot of times on like exterior walls, okay? The installer shows up, the concrete looks great. What they don't realize, those are precast walls. They might have a form release agent on them, okay? So you have to do your due diligence to do the prep up front, all right? You don't want anything that's a bond breaker on there. These things have to be clean, sound, and solid. Something as simple as maybe doing a water test on it. Put some water on it. If it beads right off, that's a good sign that there's something there. So you've got to get it off. You could see the stone that fell off the wall here. All that was was literally the stone was installed on a, a wall that had a form releasing agent, and it simply fell off. So again, you might be doing everything you can on the front end to use lightweight materials that are safer for your employees, the environment. But if you don't look at the back end, worry about the things that you should, you could have a, a claim as well, all right? And I always wanna point out when I bring this up, no chemical cleaning, 
okay? You're always gonna wanna make sure you do it mechanical, whether it's a high pressure water blaster, bead blasting, never use acids. Again, you're dealing with porous materials. This is gonna be able to soak into something and very hard to get out after the fact, right? So you always wanna make sure you do your due diligence up front. Another one too is try to, again, look at the industry standards, read the labels on the bag, okay? I always tell people this. Some people actually have had people get offended when I do presentations when I say that. And I, I'm not challenging them. I'm making sure that they know that they're in what product they're using, okay? A lot of these products are highly engineered now, highly, right? They have science in the bag. Before it used to be a sand cement mix that you would do outside. Now all the chemistry is in the bag. You just have to add water. So it's very important to read the bag. It might have special mixing times. It might have a time to slake or slack. The tomato, tomato again, right? But you have to make sure you read the bag. Know the temperature range it could be installed in. And note that that's the surface temperature, okay? A lot of guys will go out there and say, oh, it's 45 degrees out, but it was freezing the night before. They put it on that substrate and it's not curing. Again, that's not a product failure. That's a lack of knowledge, a lack of due diligence on the front end, okay? Also store your materials in safe places, okay? Don't leave it in the Connex box right up until the day you install, or don't leave it in the back of your truck the night before and let it heat up to 100 or freeze, all right? You have to do some work in the front end, again, to have safer installations. A good rule is the 18 degree rule, all right? All of these products are made to an intended, you know, I guess tested, let's put it that way, at 70 degrees, okay? That's where all the performance characteristics are coming from. So the 18 degree rule for every 18 above 70 degrees, they're going to take half as long to cure. So you imagine 90 degree day in Texas or something like that, that's going to kick off quick. All right. That's immediately going to hurt the performance of the product. Right. It's immediately on the other end, it goes the same way for under 70. Right. So it's going to take twice as long. So you figure if you have a product that's mixed with water and then it freezes overnight, that's pretty much it. You've immediately compromised the integrity and the, you know, the intent for that material. Again, if it starts falling off the wall, it's not the material's fault. All right. Safety is not just on the material, it's on the installer as well. Again, know the best practices, do the due diligence, right? Try to find these resources. The TCNA handbook's a great one, all right? Find these ANSI standards, find the details that go along with them. They're gonna tell you everything, all right? They're gonna tell you from substrate prep to the actual quality and manufacturing process of the material, how they should be installed, how long they should cure, there's even information in there about what those systems are gonna weigh. If you have you know, dead load questions and stuff like that, it's all there. So use these resources to your advantage, all right? Have them on your, you know, your back burner, keep them on your computer, keep a book in your truck. Again, you wanna be a resource for these people that are specifying these projects or the homeowner that's asking to have this installed, right? They might want this beautiful tile put in their pool and they can't fathom why they can't put it in. You need to be the resource to show them, hey, you know what, this might not be the best answer right? Here's why. Show them the resources, okay? Don't get in the back and forth, he said, she said. Use these things to your advantage. And then they also use qualified labor, okay? If you're a specifier, make sure that you're specifying into the projects, someone that has experience doing this. Again, someone might do beautiful bathrooms and stuff inside residential. They've never installed, say, a pool. They've never installed an exterior project. Make sure that you put in there that they have the qualifications and the proven track record of doing these types of installs before they get on the job, all right? Lowest qualified bidder is a dangerous thing, okay? <laughs> so again, we have to start changing our perception, right? We need to take accountability on the front end, make sure that we're doing what we can to get these successful installations, and again, overall safer, all right? And if you're an installer, don't just assume you know everything, all right? We hear the banter all the time. I work in technical services, right? So we'll get the calls all the time. Well, I've done it like this for 30 years and you name it, that's fine and it probably worked for you. But there's gonna be that one job that jumps up and bites you. So do your due diligence as an installer too. Get out there, get trained, get certified, learn as much as you can. That GPTP is a, a great example. A lot of people just see those, someone asks about them or they want them in their store, their house, you name it. They just look at it, think, oh, it's a big tile. They set it the way they normally would and then the problems are astounding on the back end, right? And then you're looking at ripping out whole walls, right? Not just little patches, because they're literally taking up the whole wall or floor in most cases, okay? So again, do your front end work, get trained, know what you're installing, read the label, if I'm beating a dead horse. But again, safety is multifaceted. So you got the products, right? We have the lightweight materials that can provide that. We have the education, and it all comes together. 
So long story short, just kind of wrap it all up here. Um, I went short on time. I talked pretty fast, but we are, again, lightweight materials. We're thinking about we're working safer. So we know the benefits of those, right? We're going to have the ease on the back, loading the job, freight benefits, right? A lot of them, again, no silica or silica that isn't respirable. So all of those benefits are going to make it safer, all right? We're going to be able to work faster without compromising that safety. So this is a trend in the industry, right? Constant improvement. We're always evolving and innovating to go this way, right? So you have rapid setting, all right? So you're able to save time in many layers, right? But without compromising any, uh, without compromise any output. We're still able to increase output on these while still being safe and working faster. This is a huge, huge trend in the industry, one that's not going to go away, especially when you consider some of the raw material shortages. So the sooner that we could do this, all right, the sooner that we could factor these into projects, the more beneficial it is going to be for our industry. All right. There's a lot of competition out there. There's, you name it, resilient, carpet, cheaper options, stuff like that. But we need to preach the safety, the sustainability, and the longevity that Tile can provide. That's pretty much it. Jim, I apologize for going short. I definitely uh, get going fast. Um, but I think that leaves us more time for questions. I think there will probably be a good amount. Um, Marcel, uh, that was a lot of information presented quickly. <laughs> And uh, I want to make sure everybody that's in attendance knows you can go to the NTCA YouTube page. Uh, probably tomorrow afternoon it will be up, and you can watch this as many times as you want to review everything that Marcel, you know, mentioned and went through. Uh, I think you went through it so fast. There's only really one comment we have here so far. Um, uh, one of our attendees said the, the wet the weight of wet mortar needs to be considered when using uncoupling mats. I think you mentioned some about using coupling mats to save weight, but there is some extra weight there. Yep. yep. Uh, that is true, and we understand that. Um, are there any other questions? Is anyone going to type a question in for us? Because there was a lot of information there, and this information. Sorry, sorry I didn't want to cut you out there, Jim. So one of the things too that and. Hopefully they're doing it correctly, right? Uh, cement board too. A lot of times people do bring that up, the weight of the wet mortar with the uncoupling. The same should be done with cement board, right? A lot yep. of people don't realize that. They're just screwing <laughs> and they should also be gluing, right? Um, so not challenging that, but just keep that in mind, right? We wanna do proper install, again, read those standards and make sure we're doing it right. Right. I think it's really important if uh, you're an architect, you're a designer, you're a store owner, or a, 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 a selection center that this information should be shared with all installers, all contractors, and they should know where to find out the right information and absolutely on how to do a job correctly, using the right products, saving time, saving weight. And number one thing I think Marcel said, saving our planet. It's very important and uh, uh, I'm glad that you brought that up. So uh, here we go. Let's see here. We got uh, Someone saying, great job, lots of info to consider. Of course, that is true. Um, is there a weight difference for single component grouts versus cement grouts? How about that question? Uh, negligible. Um, usually, easy way to do that is look at the size and the coverage, right? Um, it's going to be negligible, though. It's And the, honestly, de depending on the, a lot of times the grout, coverage weight to the whole system is going to depend on the tile size too, right? The thickness, the amount of grout joints and all that stuff. Right. Um, so yeah, that's a big, big part of the, the consideration as well. Yeah. And then about lightweight, um, like foam boards for large tiles of sizes 36 by 72 or whatever. Um, I, I'm not sure what he's actually asking. Sure. Uh, uh, Vitaly, can you add more to your question and send that to us and we'll answer it? I, I, I don't know exactly what you're, if you're just commenting or if you have a question, uh, do foam boards work with a uh, yeah. large size tile like that maybe? Yeah, I would think so, you know, and just to, to reassure them, yeah, so, you know, the, I guess the weight on the system of a whole is going to be fine. Those boards still have to be sunk into the framing, um, you know, every 12 inches or whatever it is. and Read, again, read the label, right? Read the manufacturing instructions. It's going to tell you what that phrase, uh, framing spacing has to be, uh, deflection and all that. But as long as that's met, the board's still going to be able to handle it, right? Uh, make sure that the boards can be used in that environment as well, though, right? So some of these lightweight boards are great for showers and stuff, for example, but you might not want to bring them outside on the outside of a building, okay? So know what they're being intended for. So don't just assume you can get away with murder uh, by using something lightweight. 
do the due diligence, read the data sheet. Um, you know, I'm sure you're aware of this, Jim, and a lot of people on this thing. Most of the problems come after the fact. It's, uh, well, I, I didn't think you needed that, or they'll tell you it's blasphemy when I say you need, say, in a pool, sometimes you need expansion joints every eight feet or something like that. They're, well, that's crazy. You know, and I'm like, well, that's the truth. You know? <laughs> um, right. So whether you think it or not, you, you got to know before you get into that type of stuff. So one of uh, NTCA's trainer made a really good comment here. When you're talking about sustainability and everything, he said, is there um, an approved way to dispose of dirty wash water, cement versus single component versus epoxy, all those kind of things? Yeah, so you know what? That's honestly a lot of times going to be on the local municipality. Um, so know that going in as well. A lot of times we'll get that call. How do I dispose of X? Some places it's as simple as mix it up let it get to the solid state and then you could dispose of it that way in a dumpster. Um, so you really have to, it's not all the same really, um, depending on even lo local water sources for the places it could be different, um, local transfer stations. So always do your due diligence to, to look at that in the back end. You know, and never down a drain. <laughs> yeah, never down a drain, please. Never down a drain. Yeah. Um, does does Laticrete have a resource available for searching for certified skilled installers? Um, you know, CTI with the Ceramic Tile Education Foundation, uh, they'll they'll give you a list of certified installers. Um, NTC yeah, so we don't, yeah, so we don't, you know, we a lot of a lot of times refer to that. Um, we don't do true certifications um, as a manufacturer, uh, but you know, we do have resources of local sales reps all over the country, all over the world, to be honest with you. So we usually will typically reach out to the local rep, but we'll have the relationships with the people that they know do the good work. Um, and then it kind of goes that way. So you're building a relationship, not only with the rep, with the installer. Um, and we find that specifiers and stuff kind of like that method versus just blanketing. A lot of people can just go to a training, get a certificate, say they have it, get listed on the website, that doesn't mean the guy that's showing up on the job is actually going to be that guy. So we try to make it more personal than that. Yeah, I like that. And so, Alice, I think I, I think what uh, Marcel's saying is check with the manufacturer of the product that you're using. Ask them if they have a recommendation in the area. They can talk to their local sales rep or technical rep yep. and um, maybe give you a recommendation. And if, if yeah. any manufacturer, it's probably a good idea. NTCA will will we'll give you a list of our, our NTCA members. Um, but again, NTCA doesn't certify installers either. The C Ceramic Tile Education Foundation, CTEF, they certify installers and they would be a good place to go and find certified installers too. Yeah, so. good good point too, Jim, is you know, think about the install too. So like uh, I think I mentioned a few times in the presentation, a guy may be very good at backsplashes. Um, so size and scope is a lot to do with it where he may have never done a pool. So that local rep, that relationship can say, hey, what's the project? GPTP too, right? Um, a lot of those, you do have to basically get certified to do that. So you want to make sure that you're getting someone that knows what they're doing and has done it. Um, so again, you don't want to just, hey, I went to this training, I'm certified now, and then you get bit in the back end, right? You want to actually know that they have a history with the actual installation that you're being asked to do. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, uh Great information, Marcel. I really appreciate it. And um, everybody, you know, please look forward to our next uh, webinar. There's lots of information coming and we'll have another one later in September. You'll all be invited. I want to thank you, Marcel. That was uh, eye-opening, enlightening, and uh, I love the direction our industry is going with lightweight, uh, more sustainability and, and uh, helping to uh, do jobs faster, safer, and um really taking care of our earth so thank Absolutely. you very much. yeah and please you know anyone on here don't hesitate to reach out to us i think it's no secret jim we're extremely accessible as a company um you can get us on chat you name it social media you can get us anywhere we're out there um you could even mm -hmm. if you do a little digging find the owner of our company and president's uh, information so please don't hesitate to reach out to us we like to be a resource in the industry as a whole so great thank All you right. And uh, right. have, a, have a good uh, rest of your week, everyone. And uh, Marcel, thank you. Take care. Thank bye you, bye. Jim. Have a great day, all.